it's 8.03. Uh, uh, I call this meeting to order. This is uh, Wednesday, June 8th, 2022, and night 13 of annual town meeting. Uh, so let's close voting now on the attendance check-in. Again, if you didn't get your vote in, um, that's no problem. It's just a test vote. And we'll just cycle through the screen so everyone can check that they're voting, whether it worked. And while we're waiting for these screens, I just want to apologize in advance if I have a sneezing fit through the meeting, uh, as my allergies have been pretty out of control today. Okay, so let's uh, bring up the, the performance of the Star Spangled Banner. So I'll just make some brief opening remarks um, and then we'll dive right in. So good evening, everyone. This is hopefully our last session of the 2022 annual town meeting. We have four resolutions remaining and at least one reconsideration to consider. I wanna thank everyone for their forbearance and endurance with this remote town meeting. By any measure, this has been a long town meeting by Arlington standards and by the standards of town meetings across the entire Commonwealth. I sincerely hope that the next time we meet, conditions will be safe enough that we can meet in person and see each other's faces and smiles as town meeting was intended. Uh, to any town meeting members out there who question their ability to endure more lengthy town meetings like this, I wanna assure you that I will do whatever I can to make town meeting work for town meeting members. Next time, I'll have a lot more than just three weeks to handle the logistics and complexities involved in planning town meeting. And between now and our next town meeting, whenever that's gonna be, I want us to approach this institution as a collaborative partnership. In the coming days, I'm going to send out a survey to town meeting members to ask about your experiences at this town meeting, what worked and what didn't work, with the caveat that if we meet in person next time, and I hope that that's the case, the format will clearly be different from what you experienced in, in town meeting this time. I want to thank everyone who participated in, in this town meeting. I've heard from town meeting members who participated remotely from all sorts of places under all sorts of conditions, even a hospital room. Your dedication is what continues to inspire me uh, about the dedication and seriousness of the people of Arlington to continue this long experiment in democracy. We're only ever a generation away from losing it and the responsibilities we share serve not just the current residents of Arlington, but future generations. I wanna give a special thanks to everyone who helped in the preparation of this town meeting the team that pulled together a remote town meeting in record time, the staff running the technical aspects of the meeting that are kind of invisible to everyone that you don't see, the boards and committees that submitted reports and brought forward the articles that we've been deliberating, 
and also the residents who did the legwork to create petitions and gather signatures to shepherd ideas into action. This shared effort is democracy at its finest, and I'm just so proud to be a part of it, and you should be too. Without further ado, I recognize the chair of the select board, Mr. Diggins. Thank you, Ms. Moderator. It is moved that if all business of the meeting as set forth in the warrant for the annual town meeting is not disposed of at this session, then when the meeting adjourns, it adjourns to Monday, June 13th, 2022 at 8 p.m. Okay, we have a motion. I, second. I, I suppose I should recognize the second, even though I very sincerely hope we don't need this. Um, and so uh, please raise your hands in Zoom if you have any objections to us reconvening if we don't finish tonight on uh, Monday, June 13th at 8 p.m. Okay, seeing no hands raised, it's a unanimous vote. Uh, I now call for uh, announcements or resolutions. Uh, please raise your hand in Zoom if you have an announcement or resolution you'd like to share uh, with the meeting. Okay, uh, let's bring up uh, Ms. Hyam. Okay, before we take that, it sounds I'm uh, seeing some notes and uh, some messages in the Q&A that raised hands were, were not enabled. So let's actually just back up for a second. Um, and that's exactly what I was going to bring up. Oh, okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, so let's back up. Uh, now that raised hands clearly are enabled, um, as evidenced by Ms. Hyam's raised hand, uh, are there any objections to uh, recon if we don't finish tonight, reconvening, as is Mr. Foskett's motion seconded by Ms. Brazil, uh, to reconvene on Monday, June 13th? Okay, so there are some hands. Um, okay, I see seven, so I declare it a uh, a majority vote, an overwhelming majority vote uh, uh, that we will reconvene on Monday. Um, if, if we're actually running close to the three hours of tonight's meeting uh, later on uh, and we have the end in sight, uh, I, 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 I will kind of, uh, I will consider us staying longer to just finish it out and we'll see what the circumstances are and play it by ear. All right, thank you. Uh, so the, the, the uh, the motion by Mr. Foskett, uh, seconded by Ms. Brazil, uh, uh, passes. And uh, so I now again call for announcements or resolutions. Raise hands in Zoom if you have an announcement or resolution. Okay, I recognize Ms. Kelleher. Thank you, Mr. Oh, Mr. Is, I, I'm sorry, there, there's a question in the queue. This is not about uh, receiving reports. This is announcements and resolutions. If I misspoke, I apologize. I think I called for announcements and resolutions. Yep, Ms. Kelleher. Um, yes, I have an announcement from the Affordable Housing Trust Fund. Um, as Karen Kelleher, Precinct 5, and Chair of the Arlington Affordable Housing Trust Fund. As most of you know, Town Meeting created the Affordable Housing Trust Fund to provide for the preservation and creation of low and moderate income housing in Arlington. At that time, commitments were made to prepare an action plan informed by a community process to establish the initial priorities and strategies that will guide the trustees in the exercise of our duties. Tonight, we would like to invite town meeting members to participate in the action plan process over the next several months. We've broken this process down into four stages. The planning and preparation process, which has occurred in the first part of this year. The community engagement process, which will kick off this month and extend through June and July. Release of a draft action plan at the end of the summer and a public review and comment period in September. At the end of this process, the action plan will be presented to the select board for approval. There's more detail um, in some slides that I'm um, not sure if they're on the screen because I'm looking at my text, but they'll be posted on the trust, web, trust funds website. This process will build on, not duplicate the town's prior work to understand housing challenges and opportunities, and will place a particular focus on engaging the voices of those most likely to need and benefit from affordable housing for low and moderate income households. Realizing our mission will require collaboration and alignment among the town bodies that have an interest in or authority over housing we will be soliciting input from the town manager, the planning staff, select board, redevelopment board, CPA committee, the ZBA, the housing authority, the housing corporation of Arlington, and of course, town meeting members. I'd like to ask trustee Calpurnia Roberts to describe the upcoming community engagement, <coughs> offer some ways that the town meeting members can participate and support the trust efforts to develop a proactive plan to create and preserve affordable housing. Calpurnia. And, uh, and is Ms. Roberts a resident of Arlington? Yes, I am. Okay, uh, can, uh, can you state your, uh, welcome to town meeting. Uh, can you state your, your name and address please for the meeting? Um, my name is Calpurnia Roberts. I live at 420 Mass Avenue. Okay, thank you. Uh, you, you can go ahead. 
Okay, thank you. Um, good evening, I am Calpurnia Roberts. I'm a trustee of the Arlington Affordable Housing Trust Fund and a resident of Arlington. I like to describe the community engagement process that will inform the action plan that Karen referred to earlier. During the second half of June, we'll be inviting residents to participate in a brief survey to solicit their input about Arlington's affordable housing needs and priorities. The survey will be available online and we'll be organizing volunteers to take the survey out into the community to solicit responses from the public on the sidewalk via a street intercept survey process. The results of the survey will be analyzed and shared um, and will inform the action plan. After the 4th of July, we'll be conducting targeted listening sessions specifically with people who are underrepresented, including seniors, young people, renters, people of color, and people with disabilities or special needs. These will be held in places and formats that are convenient and comfortable for the target group, and outreach will be tailored accordingly. While these will have limited attendance, the results again will be analyzed, shared, and inform the action plan. Finally, we'll host open public forums to engage and invite input from the general public, both during the community engagement process and during the review period for the draft action plan. And Dr. Roberts, Karen, Dr. Roberts, I just wanna let you know, you have about, um, about 30, 35 seconds left. Okay. Yeah. The trustees know the town meeting was overwhelmingly supportive of the trust fund, and we'd like to offer several options for you to be engaged. We invite you to promote and take the survey. We'll be soliciting volunteers to help with the intercept survey. We hope you'll participate in the public forums so you can share your ideas and learn about what we found. Finally, while we are pleased to have um, some early funding opportunities, the trust fund does not have a sustainable source of funding to fuel our work over the long term. In the near term, we encourage you to one, ask your state legislatures to pass the transfer fee home rule petition that town meeting sent to the state house for approval last year. We also hope we can count on your support to protect and expand local but, Dr. Roberts, clubs available. Dr. Roberts, I'm sorry, we're at the, the four minute mark. Uh, so if you can just wrap up very, very quickly. I will, yep. thank you. There are, we hope that you support and protect and expand local ARPA funds available for affordable housing initiatives. Thank you very much. Thank you for your time. Great, thank you. I should have mentioned ahead of time, uh, there is a, a four minute uh, time limit on uh, announcements and resolutions. Um, uh, as well as reports from committees, which we'll, we'll do shortly. Um, okay, do we have any, other, I see another hand, I assume that this is still for uh, an announcement or resolution. Let's bring up uh, Mr. Jefferson. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Uh, Bob Jefferson, Precinct 12, I'll be brief. Uh, hopefully this being our last night of town meeting, I would just like to personally, and I believe on behalf of a lot of town meeting members, acknowledge and thank the work that Adam Chapdelaine, our town manager, has done for us over the past 12 years. Um, as a lifelong citizen of the town of Arlington, a town meeting member for over 30 years, and a town employee of 36 years, I always found Adam to be professional and very open-minded. I feel that he's done very well for the town. I think he uh, brought us to, to, to new places. And I think this being our last town meeting, hopefully our last night of town meeting this year. Um, I just want to acknowledge and thank him. And if I was in town meeting right at town hall right now, I would be standing and applauding him. And I believe many of my fellow town meeting members would be joining me. Adam, thank you. I wish you the best in your uh, new endeavors. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Great, thank you, Mr. Jefferson. Uh, and likewise, uh, many thanks and much gratitude to Mr. Chapdelaine um, uh, for all the work that he's done uh, for our town. Thank you. Um, any other announcements or resolutions before we move on? Okay, seeing none, um, I now call for reports that are ready to be received. Uh, Mr. Foskett? Mr. Moderator, Charles Foskett, Precinct 10. I move that Article 3 be removed from the table. Okay, do we have a second? Second. Okay, we have a motion by Mr. Foskett to remove Article 3 from the table to bring it before us, and a second by Ms. Brazil. Uh, uh, you can uh, please uh, raise hands in Zoom if you object to removing Article 3 from the table uh, for us to receive reports from the committee. Uh, seeing no objections, I declare that a unanimous vote, and we are now ready to receive reports. Um, uh, let's see if anyone has a report that's ready to be received, uh, please raise your hand in Zoom. I see uh, uh, Ms. Sankalia um, has, uh, has her hand raised. Uh, go ahead. Um, good evening, Mr. Moderator. Thank you. Uh, Priya Sankalya, Precinct 13, a co-chair of Zero Waste Arlington. 
I'd like to submit uh, the report for Zero Waste Arlington Committee to town meeting. Um, I won't go into the details. I hope all of you will take a look at it. Sorry to be submitting it on the last day of town meeting, hopefully. Um, I just want to make a, a statement to say that um, we appreciate all the support that we got on Article 12. And I know that there were several people who um, said a lot of things about you know, future implementation. Uh, we need help. Um, and so we are welcoming uh, town meeting members and other uh, citizens who would be Arlington residents would be willing to come and help us out. We're, you know, uh, we meet on the fourth Thursday of every month and uh, volunteers are very, very welcome. So uh, thank you, Mr. Moderator. Great, thank you, uh, Ms. Ankalia. Um, okay, uh, are there any other reports to be received? You can raise your hands in Zoom if you do. Uh, Ms. Stamps, let's bring up Ms. Stamps. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Can you hear me tonight? Yes, I can, go ahead. Oh, that's great. Um, Susan Stamps, Precinct 3, a member of the Tree Committee, and I have the Tree Committee report for 2021. Um, very briefly, um, we continued to use the tree inventory and the tree management plan, which we have produced in prior years, to uh, continue to plant trees, where the tree department has planted about 150 trees in the spring and 150 trees in the fall over the last couple of years. We're really, um, uh, we are advising the tree warden um, on where to plant, or we're helping to advise him, and he is, has been targeting particularly um, environmental justice areas, i.e. low-income low areas, um, that typically uh, need more tree canopy than other areas anyway. And also we've been focusing on heat islands in town and heat islands are places that everyone's familiar with where you walk down the street and it's just really hot and you, you wish you had a tree nearby. So we're really focusing on that with climate change um, um, being the reality now. We um, are continuing the community canopy program where we're selling trees at a discount to um, to residents, we've had very positive impact and we, we hope to expand the community tree uh, canopy program in many different ways um, over the next year and or two to plant many, many more um, uh, trees in town um, and also including on uh, commercial property and just getting more trees in the ground. We um, have, we started and adopted a tree program to water trees a couple of years ago, um, early in the pandemic, um, because we, we, didn't have, we didn't have personnel to water the trees enough. And we, we've had um, many, many people in town step forward, adopted a new baby tree with a water bag near their house, keep it watered. I just want everybody to know we still need people to step forward if you go to the town website or to the tree committee website, arlingtontrees.org and sign up to adopt a tree for watering. Um, the trees will very much thank you. And I think I'm gonna stop right there because we have a lot of work to do tonight, but we really appreciate everybody's support of the tree committee. And there was a meeting tonight, um, which Mary Ellen Arano, another uh, uh, town meeting member and I belong, um, were at, briefly, and we were so excited to see that the CONCOM has appointed a liaison um, to our to the tree committee. And he was there for the first time tonight. And his, his name is Mike Gilster, Gilder, Gildersgain, I think. And that is just wonderful collaboration. And we're excited about having more collaboration with other committees uh, going forward. Thank you. Great, thank you, Ms. Stamps. Uh, let's see. Any other uh, raised hands in Zoom for any reports from committees that are ready to be received? Oh, okay, seeing none, uh, Mr. Foskett. It's the moderator, Charles Foskett, Precinct 10. Uh, I move that Article 3 be laid upon the table. Okay, we have a motion to, move, uh, to lay Article 3 upon the table. We have a second from Ms. Brazil. Uh, please raise hands in Zoom if you have any objections to laying Article 3 upon the table. And we'll leave that on the table uh, uh, until we're done with the meeting. We have uh, one objection. Okay, it is an overwhelmingly positive vote that I declare. And so we now have Article 74 before us. Um, let's bring up Article 74. 
And so now that we're into the resolutions portion of town meeting, uh, we're gonna have uh, different rules that we're gonna follow, which I emailed uh, a letter in advance about this. Um, but you know, I will step us through that. Uh, we'll first um, hear from uh, the, the select board chair about the vote from the select board, and then I'll bring up the proponent. Uh, and then if there's anyone to speak against, uh, like if anyone kind of notified me in advance uh, of, of an interest in speaking against, which was only one of those on one of the articles, then I will take up that speaker, uh, and then I will entertain uh, a motion to terminate debate. Uh, so then it'll be up to the meeting to decide if they want more deliberation uh, on any of these resolutions. Um, so with that, uh, Mr. Diggins, you want to kick us off with Article 74 and tell us about the select board vote on this resolution? Sure. Thank you, Ms. Moderator. And just so you know, I'm, my, um, my computer is needing a reboot in a bad way. I'm trying not to, but if I disappear, that's okay. that happen. Means Article 74, support of the mass fair share constitutional amendment. Though we had to wag our finger a bit and warn that we shouldn't chime in on every state ballot initiative, the select board voted unanimously and enthusiastically in favor of this resolution. Though I'm sure that there are some cogent arguments against this constitutional amendment, in my humble opinion, one of the best arguments in its favor is that it will increase the wealth in our commonwealth. So whereas billionaires will have a smaller piece of the pie, the pie will, the pie will be bigger and they may well even have more as a result. I'll keep this brief and end with a haiku. Support 74, demonstrate how much we care. Let's pay our fair share. Thank you, Ms. Moderator. Okay, thank you, Mr. Diggins. And uh, also a late addition to the uh, procedures for the resolutions, uh, I decided I, I'll, I'll, uh, I accepted questions in advance. Uh, and so I'll read off some of the questions um, before I call for termination of debate on any of these articles. Uh, any of these resolutions. Um, okay, so now let's uh, let's bring up uh, Mr. Bagnall, who is a town meeting member and uh, one of the proponents. And then I believe he has someone to introduce. Mr. Bagnall. Uh, good evening, uh, Mr. Moderator. I'd like to introduce uh, Linda Hansen of Webster Street and a fellow resident of Precinct 9. Okay, so uh, Ms. Hansen is a resident, you say? Uh, so let's bring up, uh, let's start the timer as well. Um, and uh, Ms. Hansen, are, are you with us? Can you, uh, I am. Can you hear uh, me? Yes, uh, name and address, please. Good, good evening. Linda Hansen, Precinct 9. I want to begin by thanking Mr. Diggins and the Select Board for their support for this resolution. I created a video that outlines my reasons for putting this resolution in support of the Mass Fair Share Constitutional Amendment before town meeting and for encouraging you to support it. I also want you to know that I support the proposed amendment from Precinct 17 Town Meeting Member Amy Slutsky. I consider the additional language a friendly amendment. At this point, I will ask you to please play the pre recorded video. Hello, my name is Linda Hansen, Precinct 9. I am the proponent of Warrant Article 74, a resolution in support of the Mass Fair Share Constitutional Amendment. The Fair Share Amendment is a ballot question that will be on the upcoming November 8th statewide ballot. I bring this article before town meeting because of this amendment's potential to positively and significantly impact residents across the state, as well as its potential to positively affect our municipal budget here in Arlington. Our current state constitution prohibits a graduated income tax. All residents, regardless of income, pay the same income tax rate. The Fair Share Amendment would amend the state constitution to create an additional surtax of 4% on annual income that exceeds $1 million. The first million would be taxed at the flat tax rate of 5%. Only income above that amount would be subject to the surtax. Funds raised from the surtax would be specifically directed to transportation and public education. It would raise an estimated additional $2 billion in revenue per year, every year, and the fact that it would be sustained funding is incredibly important. In these sectors in particular, one-time funding is not enough. Ongoing sustained revenue is critical for long-term planning and investments. If passed on the transportation front, this additional revenue would serve to maintain and improve our public transportation system. It could support climate resilient transportation measures like electrifying more of our public transit system and allow us to invest in alternative transportation modes like protected bike lanes. It would also provide funding to repair and maintain our roads and bridges. 
On the public education front, this additional revenue could help pay for universal pre-K for working families, allow the state to fully fund the Student Opportunity Act for K-12, which increases state funding to municipalities to more accurately reflect the true cost of educating students. Finally, it could help the state reinvest in public higher education, including community colleges and state colleges and universities, allowing young people to graduate without crushing debt. This amendment was carefully crafted to consider which residents are in the best position to pay a little more toward these critical state services. By directing this tax at those earning in excess of $1 million annually, this tax targets the increasing income inequality in our state. The top 1% of income earners in Massachusetts now collect 24% of the total income in the state. You need to make almost $600,000 a year to be counted among the top 1% of earners. So this measure would affect less than 1% of mass residents. The additional 4% surtax on income over a million dollars would bring the top earners into closer alignment with everybody else in terms of percentage of total, total taxes paid relative to income. The additional revenue would support citizens across the state, particularly lower income residents and people of color who have been disproportionately impacted by reduced state aid going to these sectors. Finally, this change would benefit our municipal budget by increasing state aid for public school students and increasing funds available for transportation related projects. In closing, I urge you to support this resolution at town meeting and to consider supporting this amendment on November 8th. Thank you so much. All right, thank you. Was there anything else to add? Um, either uh, Ms. Hansen or Mr. Bagnall? Nope. Okay. Thank you, though. Nope. Great, thank you. And so one thing I, I had not uh, considered when putting together the procedures for the resolutions was handling of amendments. Um, and so we do actually have an amendment on this one. So I'm going to allow the uh, the proponent for the amendment, uh, Ms. Slutsky, uh, to introduce her amendment, and then we'll ha we'll, we'll have one speaker uh, who I've already, uh, I've already selected uh, ahead of time, uh, uh, Mr. Kepline, who contacted me um, uh, to speak against. So let's take Ms. Slutsky first to introduce the amendment, as we ordinarily do introduce amendments immediately after the proponent. Um, so can we bring up Ms. Slutsky and also uh, uh, display on screen uh, her amendment? Thank you. This is Amy Slutsky, Precinct 17. Thank you so much to Linda Hansen for bringing this really important article to our town meeting. This, my amendment addresses two additional critical issues of child development that have profound, far reaching consequences regarding an individual's quality of life. First, that it is most effective to enrich, to catch, and treat the very same issue during the earliest years. That's because it provides better long-term results. It's much less frustrating for the child and parents, is an issue of social equity and is more cost-effective. I saw this in a way I did not imagine when I began work with two-year-olds after 15 years into my practice as a pediatric occupational therapist in the elementary schools. Uh, Ms. Lutsky, sorry to interrupt. Uh, someone's asking if you can speak. Uh, I don't know if you're maybe you're not close enough to your microphone, or uh, it's not. You're not coming in as 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 uh, as loud as other speakers. Uh, Do you want me to start again? Oh no, I think that's fine to continue where you are, but maybe just get closer to your microphone or just speak is up this, a bit. Is this better? Is this better? I think so. Okay. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. Um. Okay. So so the first issue was just providing um, enriching opportunities and, and uh, intervention support, the earlier, the better. Um, much less frustrating for the child and parents. It's an issue of social equity. The second issue um, points to the role that movement exploration plays in building competence in every aspect of life, including social, emotional, and cognitive development. And the way to do that in the earliest years and even beyond is by doing what Arlington is now finally doing, providing compelling, accessible, and highly stimulating playgrounds and playscapes. These areas are typically omitted because this 
this area of, of development, sensory motor development operates mostly below our level of awareness. So I wanna thank again, Linda Hansen for bringing up this entire article um, and supporting um, this, the amendments that I, that I uh, proposed. Thank you. Okay, Ms. Litsky, we actually need a motion from you uh, to amend the main motion with oh. your. <laughs> Thank you for, the, for that coaching. Um, um, I now uh, request a motion to uh, include my amendment to the main resolution article 74 to support the Massachusetts fair share constitutional amendment. Yep, that'll do it. So we have a, a motion to amend the main motion here. Uh, do we have a second? Let's see, we have a, uh, some seconds in the portal uh, from, uh, we have a second from Ms. Babiars, was the first one to get uh, a second in. Um, so we now have the main motion and uh, Ms. Lutsky's amendment before us. Thank you. And so we have uh, one speaker that, um, uh, that requested to speak uh, against uh, uh, the resolution. Uh, so let's bring up Mr. Kepline. Thank you, Mr. Moderator, Mark Kepline, Precinct 9. Uh, about half an hour ago, I sent out uh, a letter to all the meeting members. I don't know if you had a chance to read it. Maybe I'll, I'll start out by highlighting some of the issues. Um, at the most superficial level, attacks on millionaires and going to schools and transportation has appealed. It's always popular that, that other people pay more taxes than you and I, but many in Marlington will be hurt by this tax increase. The proposal has been a populist goal for years and defeated each time, the last by the Massachusetts State Judicial Court declaring it unconstitutional. Um, a bad idea that refuses to die is back this year again as a legislative question with fewer restrictions. The one declared unconstitutional by the SJC uh, was done so because the funds were earmarked, uh, earmarked for two, two destinations, two uses. And, and fungible funds could have been taken away from them. So this year, by, by the legislators submitting it, um, the more additional money can go to those destinations. Um, so the state funding is fungible, meaning that, yes, the money earmarked in this bill that's coming up in November will go to those um, transportation and educational uses. However, the state legislature may take away other funds that would have gone there instead. So it's a simple replacement. It's not getting additional funding to to either of those. Um, when, when this bill was proposed, the state did not have a nearly $5 billion surplus, uh, which is, it, it's been running a surplus for the last couple of years. So there's no need for a new tax. Uh, the state already has excess revenue that it, they fight over what to do with. Um, secondly, the estimated extra revenue from this 80% tax increase for millionaires is grossly overstated. It's really, uh, studies have shown that it's only about half of the amount will be actually delivered. Um, the bill will create an exodus of businesses and jobs from the state an estimated 4,000 household and 9,000 9, jobs will be lost, which will then reduce the state income taxes from all those departed workers. Former residents also won't be paying state income taxes on goods or gasoline. Uh, they won't be spending household money on local goods and services. Uh, these workers won't, won't, also won't be um, adding to the state's domestic product, gross domestic product. Um, and so I've linked to the analysis um, in 2021 published by the Beacon Hill Institute. 
Raytheon just announced it's moving headquarters from Waltham to Virginia. Be certain that its top earners will move with it if voters approve this tax hike. The bill could greatly reduce startup funding for new businesses with entrepreneurs and money going to other states. If you already have ownership in businesses or stock options, you could be subject to this personal tax increase if you, if you sell um, other than long term. Uh, if you own an Arlington house or condo, you might be subject to this tax if it's not your primary residence. The tax will reduce homes on the market and turnover, at least until trusts are set up to protect the proceeds. That will happen, and the tax increase bill only helps lawyers. Uh, the bill could help your, hurt your children. Um, Massachusetts has one of the highest estate taxes in the country, up to 16%, starting from the first dollar when the, ex, when the estate exceeds $1 million. Again, unless you set up a trust. Um, a recent law change requires people inheriting 401ks and other deferred tax investments to draw them down within 10 years. So again, you know, there, there's more tax implica implement implications. So for a state with excess revenues, this tax is not just for the few earning $1 million every year, but it'll hurt many Arlington residents with one-year windfall events like Sell, selling a income producing house. It's like all the houses in Arlington are $1 million now. And um, so it's a millionaire isn't what it used to be. It'll drive many businesses and jobs out of state uh, along with future jobs not created here by s startup companies. So this is a, uh, a tax without a need um, the money won't be spent as promised. It'll, yeah, the, this money will go directly to those needs, but other money will be taken away and used elsewhere by the legislature. So I urge you to vote no. State has plenty of tax money, does not need more. And uh, this is an example of the equality versus equity uh, our, uh, situation where our taxes were equal. Everybody paid the same percentage tax, and now this is one that penalizes higher earners and higher producers. Thank you. I hope you vote no. Great. Thank you, Mr. Kepline. There was, I just want to address there was a question in the QA about uh, whether the speaker was going over time. Uh, it, it does state in our bylaws that, um, uh, let's see, I have it right here. Um, uh, do, do, do. Uh, under the category, the under the agenda category for announcements and resolutions, uh, there's a limit of four minutes. Uh, but that is announcements and resolutions, which occurs in the agenda earlier in the evening. Which, at least my reading of that, and Ms, uh, uh, Mr. Heim, town council, can correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, my understanding is that this, that does not apply to resolutions that appear as articles that come before us. Um, that the term resolution, I believe, is overloaded in that sense. Um, so uh, I'm taking the interpretation that it's a seven minute limit like, like any other article. Thank you. Um, okay, so there's no other speakers in the queue and um, I just wanna make sure that we're doing this correctly here and by the book. Um, uh, it may be the case that there are no speakers in the queue because I said I wouldn't take any more speakers until we had a motion to terminate debate. So what I wanna do at this point is if anyone else is interested in speaking on this article, uh, that you you can add yourself to the queue now. Uh, I won't necessarily I won't pick on you right away, but I want to see if there's any interest. And the reason why I'm asking for anyone who's interested in speaking is, even though I don't intend to select you right away, is that I want to know that it's un, it's it's ambiguous at this point whether the absence of any speakers requesting to speak is because I said that I wouldn't take any more speakers. Uh, or because genuinely no one actually wishes to speak. And if it's the latter, then we could actually go straight to voting on the amendment and then the main motion. And we don't have to take a vote on termination of debate. However, if people are withholding, putting their names in the speaker queue because they believe that I'm not gonna pick on them anyway to speak, um, then um, uh, 
again, like that, that can be an ambiguous situation. I just want to make the intention clear here. So if anyone wishes to speak, um, uh, you can add yourself to the speaker queue so that we can know whether to take a vote on termination of debate. Um, okay, so seeing no speakers, um, let's now uh, bring up a vote on the Slutsky Amendment. Um, Okay, so voting should be opening up now. Uh, we're still doing the um, the waves of voting by blocks of precincts. Um, so if you are if you are in favor of the Slutsky amendment, uh, vote yes. If you're opposed to it, vote no. And uh, again, like the, the waves of precincts are being enabled uh, uh, one by one. So if you see the yellow highlighted text in the voting portal saying that your controls will be enabled in the next wave. Uh, then just uh, just hold tight for several seconds and you'll be then allowed to vote. Um, if you see a, uh, a, a voting button, like to cast your vote, please vote and confirm your vote. Um, and can we bring up the text of the Slutsky Amendment uh, while, while folks are voting so they know what they were voting on? Okay. And the only, let's say if we could bring up the first two paragraphs that begin with whereas, because that's where the uh, the changes are in this amendment. Uh, the, um, the underlined text in those two whereas paragraphs um, are what the amendment uh, is seeking to add to the main motion. So it's the with robust therapeutic development, developmental supports, the at birth, uh, early intervention then in the first paragraph, and then the, that starts with challenging and accessible playgrounds slash playscapes in the second paragraph. And those are the proposed changes in this amendment. So if you're in favor of those, those, those pieces of additional text being inserted into the main motion of this resolution for Article 74, vote yes. If you are against adding those um, new pieces of text, then you can vote no. Okay, we're coming up to about 200 votes cast now, so just wait a little bit longer. Um, there was a comment in the Q&A about, um, you know, uh, to please not encourage people uh, to speak on these resolutions. My intention is not to encourage people to speak, but to make sure that folks know that they have an opportunity to at least you know, uh, register their desire to speak if they actually have a desire to speak. Um, So let's just wait another 20 seconds before we close voting on the amendment. Ten seconds. Okay, let's close voting on the Slutsky amendment. And as always, uh, amendments are always a majority vote, and the vote and uh, the amendment passes. Um, is a positive vote and I declare it. It's 147 in the affirmative, 46 in the negative. We'll wait for the screens to go by. It's only the termination of debate, debate vote screens that, that we'll skip. Um, oh, I should also point out uh, while we're waiting for these screens that um, there were questions submitted for the uh, remaining resolutions, articles 75 through 77. There are no um, speakers who, uh, no one requested to speak in opposition uh, to articles 75 through 77, uh, but we do have questions that were submitted. Um, and so I will um, uh, read off some of those questions uh, and try to get answers. Um, and hopefully we could do that uh, fairly efficiently. Okay, so uh, let's now bring up a vote on the main motion as amended. Article 74. Okay. 
And this is a majority vote for this resolution. So if you are in favor of the select board's recommended vote of favorable action on article uh, on this resolution, support of the, uh, the mass fair share constitutional amendment, uh, vote yes. If you're opposed, vote no. Again, we're voting on the main motion of Article 74 as amended by the Slutsky Amendment that we just uh, recently voted on and passed. Well, I didn't vote on, you all voted on. Okay, we're at uh, 200 votes cast. We'll have to wait just a little bit longer. Please try to get your votes in as quickly as you can. Okay, let's just wait another, uh, let's wait another 20 seconds. Fifteen seconds until we close voting. Ten seconds. Okay, let's close voting on the main motion of Article 74. This is a majority vote. And the vote passes uh, 165 in the affirmative, 28 in the negative. It is a positive vote. Okay, so we'll just wait for the voting screens um, to cycle through all the precincts. And then we will have Article 75 before us. As I said, I, I uh, didn't get any requests from anyone uh, to speak in opposition to any of the remaining articles, 75 through 77, uh, but there were questions submitted, which I'll, uh, I'll ask and try to get answers to. Okay, so let's bring up Article 75. Okay, so uh, Mr. Diggins, uh, why don't you kick us off with the, the select board's vote on this resolution? Yes, Mr. Moderator, thank you. Article 75, commitment to increase diversity in town appointments. The select board voted five to zero in favor of this resolution. The challenge with many resolutions is how to transform the resolution into policy. Even with the town's great efforts to increase diversity, to elevate equity, to be more inclusive, and to, great, and to create a greater sense of belonging, this resolution urges us all to commit to working harder. We are up for the challenge. It is our hope that we will support this resolution and the select board will try to lead by example in making a stronger effort. I just know someone's gonna quote me on that, but that's okay. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. All right, thank you, Mr. Diggins. And let's bring up uh, Ms. Dre, who is the proponent of this resolution. Good evening, Mr. Moderator. Elizabeth Dre, Precinct 10. Good evening, town meeting. I apologize in advance for my croaky voice. <clears throat> While resolutions are non-binding, I do believe they have an important role to play in town meeting. Resolutions serve as not only a public statement of a town's values, but also of a town's aspirations, reflecting who we desire to be as a community and guiding policy decisions that will get us there. Recent examples of such resolutions include the rehanging of the Black Lives Matter banner, the land acknowledgement, and the honoring of Indigenous Peoples Day and Prince Hall Day. The resolution before you serves to focus our collective energy 
to Arlington's stated commitment to building a community where everyone is heard, respected, and protected. It asks appointing authorities to identify and actively break down the barriers that maintain the status quo and that prevent us from benefiting from the rich diversity of experiences, perspectives, and ideas found in our community. Furthermore, it intentionally creates space on our public bodies for people from typically underrepresented groups. This resolution adds another tool to our diversity, equity, and inclusion toolkit one we can use to create public bodies that more accurately reflect the diversity of Arlington residents. <clears throat> Arlington has repeatedly affirmed its commitment to DEI. Most recently, the select board acknowledged that our public bodies do not reflect the true and rich diversity of our town and demonstrated their commitment to tackling this challenge by voting to approve the DEI director's proposal for an equity audit in part to identify barriers to access and engagement, and with the goal of bringing unheard voices to the table. Increasing diversity in our public bodies was so important that the select board last fall voted to significantly re redraw precinct boundaries to create a political landscape with a specific goal of increasing the, the diversity of town meeting. This resolution builds upon that work to achieve the same goal, but in our broader public bodies, by asking that specific attention be paid to the goal of identifying and breaking down the barriers that inhibit diversity. It also asks that when appointing authorities have two qualified candidates, they, that they consider diversity and representation of underrepresented residents in making their final decision. Diversity in our public bodies will benefit Arlington in many ways. It will make Arlington more welcoming and inclusive to a broader swath of residents, which may lead to increased diversity of those who choose to live, work, and own a business here. In addition, research shows that diverse teams are often more innovative, productive, engaged, and are better problem solvers due to the addition of new perspectives and experiences. There will likely be long-term benefits to engaging a wider group of residents to serve on our public bodies. Membership on those boards and committees is often an on-ramp to further civic and political engagement. Today's committee members may be tomorrow's town meeting members, thus helping to achieve the select board's reprecinting goals. While a lack of diversity in public bodies is a concern shared by many here in Arlington, it's not a unique challenge. Boston is working on closing similar opportunity gaps, and Somerville recently announced a new initiative to create a standardized process for recruiting community members that is inclusive and transparent. There are no easy answers and Arlington is taking steps to improve diversity, yet progress is slow. This resolution focuses on the one group that's uniquely positioned to most quickly move the town towards meeting this goal, Arlington's appointing authorities. This resolution is supported by the town of Arlington's diversity, equity and inclusion division, Envision Arlington's diversity task group and standing committee and the human rights committee. I respectfully ask for your support as well. Thank you very much. Great, thank you, Ms. Dre. Uh, there were comments in the Q&A about the timer. I apologize, we didn't have the timer going. Uh, when I realized that, I, I started a separate timer uh, that you can't see, but even that started late, uh, and I didn't want to interrupt the speaker to explain that we didn't have an accurate timing, um, but I was trying to track that as best I could. Um, um, thank you. So we don't have any speakers who asked to speak against, uh, but I do have a number of questions who were submitted uh, by Ms. LaCourt, which I will relay to the meeting now. Um, these are slightly edited from uh, uh, from Ms. LaCourt's submission to try to uh, uh, con condense things a bit. Um, so, and I believe these are mostly, if not entirely, directed at the select board. So, Mr. Diggins, uh, if you could answer any of these questions, that would be helpful uh, for the meeting. Um, first question from Ms. LaCourt is, uh, what steps is the select board going to take to improve the pipeline of candidates of committees and boards of the town? Well, I mean, the select board doesn't get to pick all of the candidates. I mean, for, for those that uh, we get to choose, I mean, I will work with my colleagues to more broadly advertise I me mean, for those positions, I mean, and try to put in place a transparent policy by which we select those candidates. I mean, so. Oh, no, so I'm sorry. Can we uh, start the timer on this? Um... Even though Ms. LaCourt isn't speaking, uh, I, hopefully we can address these within seven minutes as, as if she was actually uh, using her speaking time. Uh, Mr. Diggins, sorry, go ahead. Sure, so those are things that I would propose to my colleagues. You know, so so uh, I can't say 
right now exactly what we're going to do because I'll have to work with my colleagues to do it. But I've given you some insights as to what I would like to do in this chair and propose to my colleagues. Okay. And what is the select board's plan for developing new procedures, guidance for appointing authorities and committee chairs, et cetera? And what metrics will they use to measure success? And how will the select board be accountable to town meeting for reporting on results? Well, those are all very good questions that we'll have to work on answering. I mean, um, there's no way I can answer those in the detail that would be satisfactory to herself or me at this point in time. But we, I certainly urge Mrs. Um, Ms. Court to send those questions and to the extent that they aren't questions that we already have, we'll work on answering them and, and, and pre pre presenting something, putting something forward, forward because this is serious. I mean, I am serious about this and I think we really do need to give serious answers and, 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 and advance the cause. I mean, I, am, I myself care very much about metrics. I mean, and it is something that's very hard to measure um, uh, in this case, I mean, success or failure, um, success in particular. And, uh, but that doesn't mean we don't try first off to measure, but also don't try to accomplish the goal in the face of not having a good way to make the measurements. Yeah. And uh, why did the select board not outline these commitments in their report to town meeting? Well, that's another good question. And you know what, we didn't, but going forward, we should mean and So, so um, we, we will going forward uh, and circle back maybe to um, answer those, to do that, I mean, for this resolution in the process of moving it forward. Okay, and I see, uh, Ms. Dre is suggesting that she can answer as Ms. Dre, that's great. can you answer that? Why the select board, uh, or, uh, or, go ahead. Elizabeth Dre, um, precinct 10. I don't have the exact answers, but I do know that some of that is gonna come out of the equity audit that is um, will be undertaken this year. And so I think that we don't, um, that's gonna help us get the data that we need and to will also hopefully help identify what the barriers are. Um, and with that information, we can use it then to, to sort of um, roadmap how we get to where we wanna be. Um, but I think the equity audit is gonna give us a lot of the information um, that Ms. LaCourte is asking for. And from that will come a plan. Thank okay. you. Thank you, Ms. Dre. Um, and last question, if we make this brief, uh, why, is it, why does the select board, uh, Mr. Diggins, think that passing this resolution and hoping it will have an effect on residents who might want to volunteer will actually like, change anything? Why, why do we think it will? You know, well, we certainly hope it will. I mean, be doing nothing is, really not a preferred course of action. I mean, and so we, we try, I mean, if it doesn't yield any positive results, I mean, then we try something else. And, uh... Okay, fair enough. Uh, so that's all the questions. Uh, we do have a couple of speakers in the speaker queue, which uh, I'll assume are folks who are actually interested in speaking and not uh, looking to terminate debate. So at this point, I will ask for, can we enable raised hands in Zoom? and um, and so anyone who is, I will now entertain uh, a motion to terminate debate um, if anyone wishes to make such a motion. And you can register your interest in, in terminating debate uh, or making a motion to terminate debate by raising your hand in Zoom. So I see uh, uh, Mr. Klein's was the first hand that I saw. So can we bring up uh, Mr. Klein? Christian Klein, Precinct 10, move them the article and all matters before it. Okay, so we have a motion to terminate debate from Mr. Klein. We have a second from Mr. Moore. So uh, because we have speakers in the queue, we will actually take a vote. So let's, uh, let's vote on termination of debate. And as always, this is a two thirds vote. Okay, so if you, if you would like to terminate debate on uh, Article 75, vote yes. If you want to continue debate, um, vote no.
Okay, we just reached the uh, the 200 votes mark. Um, so let's just give another uh, another 20 seconds before we close voting. Ten seconds. Okay, let's close voting on termination of debate of Article 75. Maybe some of sex point either this or Okay, uh, I think someone has an open mic. Um, and so the, uh, up, I didn't see what the vote was. Um, can we just bring that? Yeah, 189 in the affirmative, 14 in the negative. Um, and so debate is terminated. Uh, so let's now open up uh, voting on the main motion of Article 75. Okay, so voting should be opening shortly. And this is a majority vote uh, on whether to uh, accept the select board's recommended vote of favorable, favorable action on um, uh, Article 75, the resolution uh, for a commitment to increase diversity in town appointments. And can, can we bring up uh, the, the, the vote language on this while, while folks are voting? Okay, um, we're at 197 votes cast now. We have a point of order from Ms. Bloom. Let's bring up Ms. Bloom. Uh, Nancy Bloom, Precinct 18. I have a question in regards yeah. to the wording. Um, I saw the word, it's moved now, but the word priorities, I was wondering whether they meant prioritize in the Warrant article text, uh, second line, mm -hmm. town supporting authorities, it should be prioritized? Or it should be priority? The town supporting authorities, uh, let me read the whole sentence. To see if the town will vote to deepen Arlington's commitment to diversity, equity, and inclusion by resolving that it, it is the desire of town meeting that the town supporting authorities prioritize and center, I believe, yeah, it should just be uh, the authorities prioritize. Yes. Okay, so the spelling is incorrect. Yeah, we, we can make that administrative change. Okay, thank, thank you. Thank you. Uh, so, Ms. Clerk, if you could make that change, um, that'd be appreciated. Okay, so we're at 202 votes cast. Um, let's just wait another, uh, another 30 seconds before we close voting on Article 75. Twenty seconds until we close voting. Ten 
10 seconds. Last chance to get your votes in. Okay, let's close voting on Article 75. And motion passes, 177 in the affirmative, 12 in the negative. Uh, we'll wait for the voting screens. And when that's done, uh, that'll bring us to Article 76. And in, um, and in preparation for Article 76, if we can bring up uh, uh, Ms. Anderson, who's the proponent, just in preparation. Okay. And so let's now go to Article 76, which is now before us. I'll open that up. And, um, and Mr. Diggins, once again, can you tell us about the select board's vote on Article 76, please? Thank you, Ms. Moderator. Article 76, resolution, Alewife Brook is a valuable natural resource. 80% of the select board either lives in East Arlington or grew up in East Arlington, so perhaps we have a bias to support this resolution as we did unanimously. No need for bias to be a factor, though, because this article stands on its own merits. At the risk of stealing some of the proponents' thunder, it seems like the U.S. EPA is on the side of the Alewife Brook. I'm sorry, the Alewife Brook. I'm sorry, the Alewife Brook. Nonetheless, let us resolve to keep working on behalf of the Alewife Brook and maybe someday it will be teaming with Alewife. And for those of you who might be on Jeopardy at some point, here's a little fact. According to an article published a couple of months ago on Cambridge State, on the Cambridge State website, the fish that we call Alewife was originally called aloof by the indigenous people. But apparently the Europeans call it Alewife because it resembled the stereotype of a tavern keeper's wife. Who knew? Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Thank you, Mr. Diggins. Uh, then let's... Um... Uh, bring up Ms. Uh, Ms. Anderson uh, uh, as the proponent of this resolution. Um, do you wish to speak to it? Yes, thank you. Kristen Anderson, Precinct 11. I am here tonight with longtime Conservation Commissioner David White, who also serves on the Water Bodies Working Group and is a town meeting member in Precinct 21. David and I founded Save the Alewife Brook. Also working as core group members are David Stoff, an alewife abutter who lives on Fairmont Street, and Gwen Spieth, our representative in North Cambridge. Jean Benson serves as an advisor. Save the Alewife Brook is a growing grassroots environmental activist group with supporters in Somerville, Cambridge, Arlington, Belmont, and Medford. We are concerned about Alewife Brook, water quality issues, and flooding, and are working towards a political solution to a century old problem. We wouldn't be able to do much without the support of Arlington. We deeply appreciate the support from the select board, the town manager, Adam Chapkalane, the town council, attorney Heim, and the engineering department, in particular, Wayne Chenard. We also acknowledge the important work of alewife activists who came before us, including Clarissa Rowe, Elsie Fiore, Diane Mahan, Carolyn Meath, George Late, and others. Two things that town meeting members can do tonight to help end the sewage pollution in the Elwife Brook are one, vote in favor of our article, and two, go to our website and sign our email petition to end the sewage pollution in the Elwife Brook. And um, if you could show the video that, um, that I sent you, that would be awesome. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Ms. Anderson. The cities of Cambridge and Somerville have very old combined sewer pipes located under their streets and sidewalks. They are called combined because sanitary sewage, which is the stuff that you flush, mixes with stormwater runoff, that's the water that flows into the catchment basins near the curb on the city streets. Sorry, this sewer infrastructure dates back to the 19th century. Uh, can we um, do something to make that, that overlay UI from YouTube disappear? Because it's hard to read the text at the bottom um, when the video is playing. If that's not possible, maybe we could uh, run it not as full screen like it's at, and try to make it as large as, as we can. Uh, 
Let, let, we can go back to just playing it full screen if, if that's the best we could do. During some of... rainstorms involving an inch of rain or more, the regional sewer system becomes overwhelmed and there is not enough capacity in the pipes for the sewage to flow to the Deer Island wastewater treatment plant. This is when the old combined sewer systems in Cambridge and Somerville discharge raw, untreated sewage pollution through combined sewer outfalls into Alewife Brook. Too much rain causes the regional sewer system to run out of capacity and raw, untreated sewage is then dumped into Alewife Brook. Why is this a problem? The Alewife Basin is prone to flooding. An estimated 5,000 residents live in the Alewife's 100-year floodplain. During major flood events, sewage-contaminated water from the Alewife Brook flows into the homes, yards, and parks of the area's residents. There are documented cases of residents becoming sick with flu-like digestive disorders after forced exposure to hazardous sewage-contaminated flood water. These are folks living in our most diverse and vulnerable neighborhoods, which the Federal Environmental Protection Agency identifies as environmental justice populations. The EPA has a mandate to protect our environmental justice populations. For over 150 years, the state of Massachusetts has encouraged Cambridge to separate their sanitary sewage from their stormwater runoff. As a result of the ongoing 1983 federal lawsuit known as the Boston Harbor Cleanup Court case, the EPA was called upon to uphold the Clean Water Act. Because of the involvement of the EPA, Cambridge and Somerville closed half of their sewer outfalls into this alewife. Cambridge has separated some of their underground combined pipes and paid for the construction of the Ilwife Reservation stormwater wetland on state land. The Boston Harbor cleanup court case has been a remarkable success for Boston Harbor and its waterfront properties. However, despite over $100 million spent in the alewife, we are seeing little improvement in the annual volume of untreated sewage pollution that is discharged into Alewife Brook by Somerville, Cambridge, and the MWRA. In fact, the sewage pollution problem is getting worse with time. This is because of an increase in rainfall and an increase in severity of storm events due to climate change, as well as an increase in impervious surfaces, continuing tree loss, and the capacity failures of the MWRA's regional sewer system. In 2021, over 50 million gallons of sewage pollution was discharged into Alewife Brook. This is the same volume as was discharged in 1992 before money was spent in the alewife to control combined sewer overflows. We are at a point now in the regulatory process where we may see a significant investment in fixing the alewife's sewage pollution problems. We will see investments made in and around the alewife brook in the coming decade, but we must work towards a regional and political solution to the water quality and flooding problems. Otherwise, nothing will happen. We must work for it. One of our goals is to win Arlington a seat at the negotiating table. Arlington has long had little voice in the matter because Arlington does not own the sewer infrastructure that is directly responsible for the sewage pollution. Arlington has never had a combined sewer system. We have already achieved some success in getting the EPA's support and defining a framework for the new Alewife long-term CSO control plan. Among other things, this framework includes our recommendation that climate change projections are used to design new area sewer infrastructure, flood control, green infrastructure, and creative funding sources, including available infrastructure money. But the planning alone is a two-year process, so there is much organizing work to do. Why is this article important and why is your vote important? This resolution seeks to collect political support to engage the town in the issue. We need your vote. We thank the members of the select board, town council, town manager, town engineer, and the town meeting for their support. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Ms. Anderson. Hello. Uh, so we didn't have anyone interested in speaking against, at least uh, no one notified me in advance of speaking uh, against this resolution. Uh, however, I do have a couple of, I, I do have some questions that were submitted uh, also by uh, Ms. LaCourt. I've called some of these questions to keep them under the scope. Uh, I want to be responsive. There, there were comments uh, in the Q&A earlier on one of the earlier resolutions uh, about scope, and I, I do want to be responsive and sensitive to that. Um, uh, so the first question, um, which I'll uh, direct to you, 
Mr. Diggins, is why does the select board think that passing a resolution, uh, this resolution will help, will help make Arlington's case for closing CSOs? So we are supporting the proponents in, in their effort in, to work we, with other entities need that are trying to get the MWRA and the, MP, and the EPA need to do more to close down more of the CSOs quicker, more, more quickly. It, um, I can't say that this is going to do anything more, you know, but it certainly doesn't hurt for us to, to try. You know, and, and it's more advocacy and, and we support the overall effort and I'm a little bit at a loss for words on this one right now uh, because what I kind of hinted at in my introduction is that the EPA has made some arguments made, or made a proposal or response made to um, the MWRA telling them that they need to take into account the effects of climate change mean and asking them to uh, work faster to close down some of these CSOs. I wish I had that information pulled up right now because the, the Save the Alewife Brook actually sent out a nice email about the recent changes or recent um, changes that or response that the EPA made to uh, the MWRA and I think it's Cambridge and Somerville. So whether or not these efforts resulted in that, and I think they did have an impact, we, we are making progress. We, and to the extent, I think the effort of the sale, Save the Ale White Brook and the, the proponents in Cambridge and Somerville be pushing for this, we um, had some impact, then I think we should join that effort. I mean, our residents have asked us to join that effort and I'm supportive and my colleagues are supportive of it. So can we quantify I mean, what, it'll, what effects it's had? No, not yet, but maybe at some point we can. Okay, and the last question is, uh, how will the select board hold itself accountable to town meeting based on this resolution? And with the caveat that of course, uh, this is my own commentary that uh, just for the uh, benefit of the meeting that this is a non-binding resolution so you're not the select board is not technically or legally required to do anything, but of course there are other, there um, uh, there could be political pressure and other means. So um, so just want to give that caveat that um, so so how would the select board hold itself accountable to town meeting based on this resolution? Um, well, you know, I, I think what we'll have to do is figure out how we hold ourselves accountable on all resolutions. Um, to town meeting, you know, to the extent that we want a formalized mechanism I mean, for doing that, I mean, then let's work on doing that. Otherwise, I mean, uh, I would say I mean, the onus is really on I mean, the residents and the proponents I mean, to hold the select board accountable. Okay. Um, with that, um, I see there is a speaker in the queue, uh, but I do at this point want to um, uh, invite anyone who is interested in, in moving to terminate debate to raise their hands in Zoom. Can we enable raise hands in Zoom, please? And if you're interested in terminating debate, you can raise your hand now. And so I see uh, the first hand I saw was uh, Ms. Rowe. So let's bring up Ms. Rowe um, to make her motion. Yes, Mr. Moderator, thank you. I move to terminate debate on this article and all items under the article. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Ms. Rowe. We have a motion to terminate debate from Ms. Rowe. We have a second from uh, Mr. Moore. So let's go ahead and vote on termination of debate.
Okay, if you're in favor of terminating debate on Article 76, vote yes. If you want to continue debate, vote no. This is a two thirds vote. Okay, all waves of precincts should be uh, enabled for voting. Uh, so please vote in the portal. If you are if you want to terminate debate, vote yes. If you want to continue debate, vote no. Okay, we're at 200 votes cast. Okay, uh, let's just give another 30 seconds before we close voting on termination of debate. Twenty seconds. Ten seconds until we close voting on terminating debate on Article Seventy Six. Okay, let's close voting, and this is a two-thirds vote, and the vote passes. Two hundred in the affirmative, eight in the negative. Uh, debate is terminated. Uh, so let's now open voting on the main motion for Article Seventy Six. So seeing the delay screen, hopefully we don't see this too much tonight. Okay, so voting should be opening for waves of precincts. If you're still seeing the yellow highlighted text, just uh, please sit tight and it should open up momentarily. Don't go away. And if you're able to vote, please vote. There's a report in the Q&A that someone's seeing, seeing a uh, too many users screen. Oh, th this one here, okay. Yeah. We'll have someone looking at that. Um, Okay, so we I, the vote count is still 
increasing. It's at, a, it's at 198 right now. Um, I will make sure that as many folks can vote as possible um, within some kind of reasonable uh, time limits. Okay. So now 203 votes cast. I apologize for the technical difficulties. The, uh, um, the vendor uh, who developed the portal is being contacted um, to see if there's anything that we could do to adjust any of the settings to make this run a little uh, more smoothly. Okay, so we have 207 votes cast. Um, okay, so that's almost everybody. So let's just wait another 30 seconds. Um, because there's only a handful of folks who have not um, voted yet. 20 seconds until we close voting on Article 76. Ten seconds. Okay, let's close voting on Article 76. And this is a majority vote. And the vote passes 197 in the affirmative, one in the negative, um, and several abstentions. So we'll just wait for these vote screens. Um, and after these screens are done, um, I'll say let's take a shorter break than we normally do just to make sure that we can squeeze in all the business that we need to to finish and dissolve town meeting tonight. Um, so we'll, we'll just take a, a five minute break tonight. And so let's, um, well, after these screens are done, so that'll put us at 937. So please return by 937 and we'll continue at that point with, uh, with article 77, which is the last article on the warrant uh, that we haven't yet disposed of, but there is at least one article uh, that there is uh, interest in uh, potentially reconsidering. Um, and so we will take those up after the break. So we're just gonna take a short five minute break. Please come back by 937, thank you. Okay, it's 937, so let's, uh, let's get started again. And let's bring up article 77. And also while we're bringing that up, uh, Let's prepare to bring up uh, uh, Ms. Crowder, uh, who's a proponent of this article. And to get us started, uh, let's uh, uh, let's hear from uh, Mr. Diggins, the chair of the select board, uh, to tell us about the select board vote on this resolution. Mr. Diggins. Thank you, Ms. Moderator. Article 77, resolution establishing an integrated pest management policy, policy for town land, prohibitions, and public education about rodenticide hazards. I'm sure that the proponent will make a strong case for this resolution, so I'll be brief. I'll just point out that this resolution is the third component of the effort undertaken by Article 18, which was on the consent agenda. The select board supported Article 18 in this resolution unanimously, and we applaud Mrs. Cr Ms. Crowder for her persistent effort over the course of two town meetings. We hope that upon becoming more aware of this issue, our residents will do all that they can to eliminate rodenticide hazards is all a part of taking care of this planet that we call Earth. And Mr. Moderator, if you'll indulge me for five short sentences, I just wanna say that this is it for me in this 2022 annual town meeting. It's been an honor and a pleasure to be the select board chair for this ATM. Regardless of the format, I love town meeting. Town meeting is a precious form of democracy and I feel that we have conducted ourselves well and in a manner in which we can be proud. I wish each and every one of you the best. Thank you, Ms. Moderator. Thank you, Mr. Diggins. And uh, let's bring up uh, Ms. Crowder as the proponent to um, uh, speak in favor of this resolution. 
And uh, if we can start the timer when uh, Ms. Crowder begins speaking. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Elaine Crowder, Precinct 19. Thank you to Carrie Teal, an invaluable co-proponent in this effort. And thank you to fellow town meeting members for sticking it out to the bitter end. I'll be brief. First reminder, the ultimate combined goals of Articles 18, special legislation to prohibit SCARs on non-public property, and Resolution 77 is that of protecting our newest Arlington wildlife resource, nesting bald eagles, and preventing our newest deaths. Three great horned owls in Monotoby Rocks Park in the last couple of weeks of suspected second generation anticoagulant anti rodenticide poisoning or ESCAR poisoning. Really the only logical way to protect wildlife, our own health and that of our pets from such exposure is to reduce ESCAR use everywhere in Arlington on private property through the special legislation request and crucially on public town property. We in town can't do this through a bylaw, but a resolution backed by unanimous vote of the select board can. That's what the article, this article 77 resolution proposes to do. With the executive stamp of the select board, it seeks to establish a unified and explicit integrated pest management policy or IPM in town and prohibit second generation anticoagulant use on town land. This policy will define and clarify town practices with respect to rodent control. It provides a very important final prong to the three pronged approach we've crafted for safeguarding Arlington's residents from exposure to escars. The first two prongs as mentioned, uh, past town meeting on the consent agenda, putting in place a tracking system and public education, prong one and sending special legislation requests to state legislature that would allow Arlington to prohibit SCAR use on commercial property and private properties in Arlington, something currently prohibited by the state. That's prong three. However, we cannot be sure the special legislation will pass the state legislature. That's why it is critically important that we commit here to stopping the use of SCARs where we have the most control on town land. Passing prong two, the article 77 resolution will demonstrate that town meeting joins the manager's office and the select board in prioritizing the creation of a unified town IPM policy. We urge this policy to state that town departments will consistently use least toxic methods of rodent control first. We also urge that it prohibit SCARs as rodent as routine rodent control on all town properties. Please join me in voting yes to pass this real work resolution. Thank you. Good night and good luck. Great, thank you, Ms. Crowder. So um, no one took me up on my offer to speak in opposition to this in advance, uh, but we do have one question on this from uh, Ms. LaCourt, which I'll direct to you, uh, Mr. Diggins. Um, I think you know the drill by now. Um, <laughs> yes, I do. <laughs> Why does the select board need town meeting to pass this resolution? Can they not impose a policy on health and human services facilities and DPW with regard to the use of particular rodenticides and integrated pest management? Well, my understanding is that this is pretty much the policy of, of the town meeting when the town manager um, addressed this issue when we were hearing it. It's very clear that the town is is if not already doing this, totally on board um, with doing it. And, uh, and, and I mean, hearkening back me to some other earlier questions on related art, well, this, this general theme, we, we, with respect to what the select board can do in general, we, we, we can set goals and, um, and we can set the goals for the town manager we, and, and we do an evaluation and we can see the extent to which the town manager you know, adheres to the goals, which be, would be the implementation of policies that come out of 
in these resolutions. And so, so that's one way we can be more accountable. Um, uh, but like I said, in, we are working towards this. In, and I guess in general, in, in, I understand where the tension is in, with resolutions and policies. In, but I would say to the extent that we ask residents to be more engaged, mean, and they we want them to see their government as their own, that they are a part of. I mean, I'm inclined I mean, to support them in these efforts. I mean, uh, and and I mean, unless there's a compelling reason to to vote negative action against the article, um, uh, and I'm inclined to support it and 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 make it clear to residents that we welcome. I mean, their interaction, there may be a better way of doing it. I mean, and if so, I mean, um, let's try and come up with it. I mean, if Mrs. LaCourt, um, or Mrs. LaCourt has some ideas, she knows I'm all ears, I mean, and anyone else, you know, but, but um, that's my take generally. I mean, I went a little bit beyond the scope of the question, but, but I was just trying to answer some other questions a little more coherently than I did earlier. So that's it, Mr. Moderator. Great, um, so is the choice coherence or or scope is that what just kidding um uh so see so i don't see anyone in the speaker queue and there's uh uh no other questions uh that, that were submitted in advance so let's go straight to a vote on the main motion of article 77. all right so if you are in favor of uh the resolution um for Article 77, uh, establishing an integrated pest management policy for town land prohibitions and public education about rodenticide hazards, uh, vote yes. And, uh, again, this is a this is a resolution. Um, if you are against this resolution, vote no. And this is a majority vote. And can we bring up the text of the uh, the vote language for this resolution? So, yeah, especially at the bottom, the uh, there the last section. Therefore, be it resolved that um, since that's uh, technically the the um, the heart of the resolution. So if you're in favor of this resolution, vote yes. If you are opposed, vote no. Okay, voting seems to be going more smoothly this time, which is good news. We just passed the 200 vote mark. So let's just uh, um, let's give folks another 30 seconds before we close voting on the main motion of Article 77. Okay, 20 seconds until we close voting. Ten seconds. Five seconds. Last chance to get your votes in. Okay, let's close voting on Article Seventy Seven. 
Okay, the vote passes 185 in the affirmative, three in the negative, and several abstentions. We'll just wait for the vote screens. So we've now disposed of all the articles on the annual town meeting warrant with the exception of article three, which is still on the table, which I'm gonna leave it there uh, just as a placeholder. So no one can claim that uh, town meeting is automatically dissolved um, because, um, let's see. Okay, we just have a few precincts left to show the votes for. Um, uh, because I do want to give an opportunity for uh, motions to reconsider. And I know that there's one uh, one such motion that's been seriously considered by a number of folks. Um, let's see. Okay, so we've gone through other voting screens. Um, so I will now, we don't actually have any articles before us. As I said, Article 3 is still on the table. Um, uh, I do want to, so at this point, let's enable raise hands in Zoom. And I want to entertain any uh, motions for reconsideration. These are not notices of reconsideration. Uh, notices of reconsideration tonight don't really mean anything because if this is in fact our last night of uh, this annual town meeting and there are no further sessions, then there's no point giving notices of reconsideration because there won't be an opportunity to actually admit, uh, uh, to reconsider anything because there's no, later, there's no future sessions. Um, so this is actual motions to reconsider. And so if there's a motion to reconsider and it gets seconded, uh, then we will have debate and we will have vote uh, by two thirds vote on whether to reconsider an article that has already been disposed of at this annual town meeting. So I see a hand from Mr. Ruderman. So let's bring up Mr. Ruderman uh, to offer his motion uh, of reconsideration. Thank you, Mr. Moderator, Michael Ruderman, Precinct 9, and thank you to the members of this meeting. We have all put in a tremendous amount of time and effort this year, and it is in full understanding and appreciation of that time that I ask you for just a few minutes more. I voted in the majority on Article 62. I gave notice of reconsideration on the night of that vote. And now I wish to move reconsideration of Article 2. And I'll pause here for a second. OK. Uh, do we have a second to Mr. Ruderman's motion to reconsider Article 52? Uh, we have a second from Mr. Siano in the portal. Um, so um, let's see. Okay, so here's how this is. Uh, let, let me explain. At first, what we're going to do is uh, we're going to have debate on whether to reconsider Article 62. Um, and the debate should be scoped to whether or not uh, we should uh, reconsider Article 62, which essentially means reopening it. Should we reopen it to uh, to have debate on it again and allow amendments to it. And I know that there is that there has been a proposed amendment which folks should have seen on the annotated warrant. Um, and so it'll open the outer, if, if we vote to reconsider Article 62, we'll open it back up for debate and voting and amendments and so on. Um, and that is a two thirds vote according to our town bylaws. Um, if that vote fails, then Article 62 will not be before us. Uh, and then we can proceed to take Article Three off the table and uh, and effectively dissolve town meeting. So, um, uh, if, however, the vote to uh, reconsider Article Sixty Two succeeds, uh, we will when we open it, we will then have debate on the the merits of uh, the main motion of Article Sixty Two and the amendment. So, hopefully, that's clear. Um, we don't do this often, so I. I, I I appreciate that the, the procedures for this are um, um, can be confusing. Uh, so we haven't really reopened Article 62 yet. We're just we're going to have debate now on whether to reopen Article 62. That's what reconsideration is. Um, and yeah, so the scopes of the two debates are going to have some overlap, but I want to make sure that the first debate that we have, which might be the only debate, depending on how the vote goes, is about whether we should reconsider it. Uh, and I understand that um, it'll be kind of impossible 
for the folks who do want to reconsider Article 62 to not talk about some of the merits of um, the amendment that they wish to put forward. Um, and so while, while it will be, I will consider it in scope to make mention of that. So folks, so if town meeting members understand if they vote for reconsideration, it's important that they understand what they're getting into um, and what exactly is gonna be reconsidered. Um, but I don't want us to spend too much time during the, the vote on recon, uh, the, the debate on reconsideration talking about the details of the amendment that may be proposed if we reconsider the article. Hopefully that's clear. It's probably confusing though, and I apologize. Um, so with that, uh, can we open up uh, a can we open up reconsideration of Article 62 so that we actually have a uh, speaker queue for for folks to request uh, to speak on? Let's see, in my version of the portal, I'm seeing that Article 77 is still open. So can, uh, are we able to bring up uh, re uh, debate on uh, reconsideration of Article 62? I think we, we have a, uh, uh, we have like a generic, uh, motion for reconsideration that we'll bring up, which I believe has been prepared in advance. Uh, and in the meantime, while we're waiting for uh, to bring up that display, uh, we have a point of order from Ms. Bergman. So let's, let's bring up that point of order. And are we having some technical difficulties bringing up uh, reconsideration on Article 62? Because I, I don't see it on my screen. Can you hear me? Yes, uh, go ahead, name and precinct and your point of order. Robin Bergman, precinct 12. I just wanted to point out that the second that you said was for this was actually from the previous resolution. So you might have to do that again. Oh, I see. Yeah, I, saw, I apologize. I didn't realize that we still had uh, Article 77 uh, that folks were requesting to speak on. So apologies for that confusion. Um, let's see. So let's, if we can clear this out and bring up reconsideration. Uh, oh, is this to... Re um, that's a reconsider 77 because, uh, oh, it says article 77 reconsider. Um, just to avoid any confusion, can we, are the, do we have an article 62 reconsider? I apologize that we didn't get this right ahead of time. Uh, not the amendment, but. Um, Yeah, apologies for that. Or do we have a generic? I thought we had a generic reconsideration um, that we could bring up. Greg, the reconsideration needs to be tied to an article. So if you want me to open Article 62, I can do that. But it's going to bring up probably that speaker queue that had been uh, frozen prior. It's up to you. I said there's no way to rename what we're seeing here, like the Article 77 reconsider to 62. Can I assume that that's probably fixed once it's created. Right. I mean, I can maybe create another Article 62 and we can potentially and we can then use the reconsider for that article that I've created. Yeah, let's let's do that. Uh, apologies. This will take a little longer, but I, I don't want there to be any confusion about what um, what folks are seeing on screen. Like if it says one number, but we're actually reconsidering a different article's number. Um, we should be able to, I think, associate it with the original Article 62, I think. We could do that. It's just going to bring up that whole speaker queue, and it's going. It's probably going to go back to the history as we had it when we closed Article. Oh, 62. when there was a speaker queue for the first time we considered Article sixty-two. I'm going to try to do this. Uh, yeah, let, let's try this. See what happens. Okay, so we have Article 62, reconsideration. Um, 
And okay, so folks should be able to, okay, so I see the speaker queue starting to, to populate. Um, so if you wanna speak on whether to reconsider Article 62, uh, feel free to get in the speaker queue. Um, and let's see. And well, well let's, let's uh, I want to make sure that uh, Mr. If Mr. Mr. Ruderman is still there, I'd make sure he finished his remarks as he moved to reconsider. And then we, we got into this kind of uh, technical mess here. So I want to make sure that Mr. Ruderman had finished his, his comments. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. I'm, I'm ready to present the outline of the reconsideration motion. Okay, yeah, please go ahead. I, I think that'll help clarify to folks. Yeah. Sure. Um, a motion to reconsider needs to be based on certain evidence. In this case, it is new information which has become available to us, the members of town meeting, since we originally considered the article when it was introduced. And I'll run through that uh, you know, very briefly. The result, in addition to the new information, there is also a way of acting upon this information, way of acting upon the information that comports with the Community Preservation Act Committee's obligation to fund certain obligations as a requirement each year. And let me start from the top then. The new information was what was alluded to but not specified in the report of the Community Preservation Act, that was consultation of some form with town council on making sure that a grant to, in this case, Covenant Church would not violate the Massachusetts state constitution article that prohibits aid to religious institutions. Having attorney Himes memo in hand, we see that his logic puts out that there is a three-part test for when it is allowable to grant aid to a religious institution, institution excuse me. And these three tests are basically disallowing tests that you cannot have something, something else or something else. Two of those points that would disallow an aid to a religious institution by a town in some form would be grants that support the purpose of the organization and grants that, I'll quote here, the primary effect would be to substantially aid the church. The grant cannot be for the purposes of, quote, founding, maintaining, or aiding a church or substantially aid a church. Since we took the original vote on the article, we've had a chance to, to confer with members of the Covenant Church community and find out, is there in fact a history of activities which would say that the grant would not be for simply the maintenance of the religious community or substantially aid the community, but it would further the, 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 the religious organization's efforts to bring in and involve the public to reach out to, to create a benefit to the general community such that we would have an interest in promoting that. We've had a chance to look at this record and we have found it lacking that the proponents excuse me, that the members of the Covenant Church congregation have every intention, which we take in complete good faith, they have every intention of offering their space to the community for public activities, but there's no record of that yet. We have intentions, but not a record, not a history. One might say, words, not deeds. We put forth that the lack of such a record of actual 
br activities that bring in and involve the community that would be furthered by the proposed grant constitute a failure to meet the tests which are outlined in Council Himes' memo on case law in Massachusetts. Further new information is that should members feel that this lack of activity of bringing in the public or reaching out to the public, should that constitute a reason to, to doubt the validity of the grant, there is in fact an avenue for acting upon it. This is not like the community development block grant, which although it looks very similar to the way the Community Preservation Act Committee uh, you know, formulates their report, uh, CDBG money is in fact one sum, which is voted yes or no. Community Preservation Act money is actually a series of grants, which town meeting has, has the power to look at individually. Therefore, an avenue for acting upon new information, if we feel that it calls into question the validity of a grant, there is an avenue to act on that, and that is by, by moving an amended motion that would affect the actual grants which we vote for. In short, take out the money from the proposed motion take out the money that was earmarked for, for the grant to Covenant Church. We can go into further details about why we feel that uh, the circumstances, the facts we have gathered here, you know, fail to meet the criteria of the test of validity. But I'll leave it at this, that there are new facts to be considered. The facts, when we present them, will draw into question whether or not this is a proper use of the town's money. There is a way of acting upon that, and we will put forth an amendment to, to the main motion, which will give effect to that action. And with that, I'll, with that, I'll conclude my remarks and ask for um, any other speakers. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Thank you, Mr. Ruderman. Um, Okay, you, uh, Mr. Ruderman did uh, reference uh, Mr. Heim and a memo that he wrote. So I did want to give Mr. Heim uh, an opportunity. Obviously, Mr. Heim is not on the speaker queue. He's not a town meeting member, but I wanted to give him the opportunity since his uh, memo was referenced um, in the prior remarks. Uh, 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 so I want to give Mr. Heim now an opportunity to speak to any of the, uh, the claims or the assertions that were made um, in regard to uh, uh, this article. Um, and, and specifically, and the um, specifically the the, the uh, uh, community preservation act funding for the Covenant Church, uh, Mr. Hine. Douglas Hine, Town Council. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. And I'll work to be as efficient as possible. Um, I think I appreciate that Mr. Ruderman is also a little bit constrained by the scope of the motion for reconsideration, uh, and I'm kind of similarly constrained because I don't know what the new evidence there is the talking about I'm not quite sure whether I'm not quite sure what the scope of my own remarks here should be but let me just say a few things and timing will indulge me in walking through what this is sort of talking about I'll be available for questions that people want me to talk about the actual merits of it but I do want to just clarify for some folks since I believe my memo is available for town meeting members i believe the cpa application is available for meeting members i think there's some correspondence as well as some other uh, documents but i, I want to just set the table for this because it's important to understand a few things when we're discussing like this it, uh, Mr. Black... let me just interrupt sorry, sorry for the interruption I, I see that there are a number of uh, hands raised uh, in in zoom i'm not sure what the intention of those hands are at this point but if, if anyone wishes to speak about reconsideration of article 62 uh, you can add yourself to the speaker queue. If you're having some trouble with that, uh, you could ask for technical support. You can get help in the portal or put something in the Q&A. Thank you. Sorry, sorry, Mr. Hunt, go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Uh, just for the purposes of this debate on reconsideration, I'll try to outline a little bit more what Mr. Uh, Ruderman alluded to, just in case there's not, um, everybody hasn't read this memo. So, uh, there's an important sort of table setting matter that I need to get out of the way first. It's black letter law that the town can't exclude a house of worship from a grant program 
solely because it's the house of worship. Okay, you can't exclude churches, synagogues, temples from a government grant program just because they're houses of worship. That would violate the free exercise clause in the First Amendment. That's what a case called Trinity Lutheran Church of Columbia uh, uh, was about. It's a 2017 Supreme Court decision, a U.S. Supreme Court. And, um, and Mr. Time, I'm sorry to, to interrupt again, but the um, I believe the memo that you're referring to and that Mr. Rudiman was referring to uh, is uh, attached to the uh, as an additional material in the um, uh, annotated warrant. So if we can show that, if you can bring that up, um, it's the memo to. BOS uh, about High Rock Church concerns. And it, uh, on page three of that memo, I believe is the three-factor test that I believe Mr. Rudiman was referring to. Um, sorry, apologies again, Mr. Hyde, for the interruption. Go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Uh, uh, moderator. So um, it's very important to understand and analysis what Mr. Rudiman is referencing as the, uh, is the anti-aid amendment to the Massachusetts Constitution within the context that the free exercise clause of the First Amendment um, informs uh, the Massachusetts court's analysis of same. So with the understanding that not only can public grants be awarded to a church, but we can't categorically exclude them because they're churches, Massachusetts courts have developed this sort of three-factor test for determining when government funds, not just CPA funds, um, can be provided to religious institutions. And the sort of three-factor test, I'm kind of summarizing here to try to keep this a little bit tighter, is um, purpose, the grants um, for the purposes of founding, maintaining, or aiding a church trigger yeah, additional- sorry, can, can, we, can we show that again, uh, what uh, Mr. Heim is referring to in the memo? Great, thank you. The second is substantiality. It's the primary effect of the grant shouldn't be to substantially aid a church. Um, Actually, if, risk, we, I'm sorry, if we can go down to page three, um, I think we lost our, our position in that. Uh, it's the three-point test, or th I'm sorry, three-factor test. Yep. Uh, uh, great, thank you. Sorry again, Mr. Heim, go ahead. No problem. Uh, risks are basically a way of trying to uh, condense what's a fairly lengthy discussion by the courts about improper entanglement between a house of worship um, uh, that would infringe on quote-unquote liberty of conscience. It's not to be honest, the clearest uh, articulation thinks is a little bit like the standard for obscenity. People say, the, the old quote is people know it when they see it, but the reality is that not everybody thinks the same things are obscene. So um, this sort of liberty of conscious test, these are all sort of three factors um, that are sort of uh, wound together in what's a sort of balancing test is it maybe the best way I can articulate it. Um, there's a lot of projects that are historic preservation projects for churches, synagogues, things like that throughout the Commonwealth. There's probably been several hundred. Um, the Kaplan case is relatively recent. I think it's 2019 where they sort of reaffirmed this balancing test after the Trinity Lutheran uh, case that I talked about. So I don't want to say anything more if, unless people have specific questions about how I would apply uh, the analysis to the facts and circumstances presented in the application. But I just want to go, I just want folks to understand that, that these things exist in a little bit of an equilibrium with each other between the free exercise clause, which mandates that we can't categorically say houses of worship are excluded from government programs, and this idea that you have to. Uh, be cognizant and careful about how much aid you can give to a religious institution and the way in which you give it. In this case, it's uh, accessibility improvements and historic preservation uh, element of the CPA. Um, as I said, uh, uh, Mr. Mr. Heim, sorry, sorry to interrupt again. Uh, uh, the, uh, just so we can bring it to the point, uh, do, do you uh, agree or disagree with uh, or have any opinion about the conclusions that uh, Mr. Ruderman was drawing uh, about your memo. Um, um. Well, Mr. Moderator, to be fair to Mr. Ruderman and, and Frank with town meeting, my motto, uh, my memo outlined uh, what should be done to um, make sure that this project meets the criteria. If I can be very brief, my understanding is that 
the CPAC uh, essentially uh, established a record and made sure that the application uh, did those things. I don't think that there's a high, I, I would say that there's a very low risk that it violates the anti-aid amendment, in my opinion. But again, to be fair to Mr. Ruderman, the other uh, folks uh, uh, looking to reconsider, I, I'm not sure what evidence they're saying that they have un uncovered, and I don't want to speak out of turn. Thank you, Mr. Bomber. Thank you, Mr. Heim. Um, okay, so let's now go to the, uh, the speaker queue. Um, let's take uh, Mr. Moore first, who's first in the list. Thank you, Mr. Moderator, Christopher Moore, Precinct 14. Having reviewed Mr. Heim's memo, I, I would say that he lays out the path that the CPAC could follow uh, to be sure that making this grant would not cause us trouble uh, with respect to the anti-aid amendment. Did the CPAC review the three-factor test and what was their conclusion? Are you right in, in, this, in this instance? Um, so so um, can we bring up, um, do we have the chair of uh, the, the uh, the CPA committee here, uh, Ms. Rowe. I believe Ms. Rowe is the current chair of uh, the CPA committee. Yes. Um, name, thank name you, Mr. Moderator. Um, we did, in fact. I'm sorry, uh, name and precinct, please. Uh, Clarissa Rowe, precinct four, chair of the CPAC committee. Um, we did, in fact, review his. Um, his three-prong approach to this. Unfortunately, and Chris and I have been talking, our minutes for the meetings do not um, reflect that, but my committee is a wonderful, very thorough, very careful committee that was very concerned about this religious institution to make sure that the work that we were doing was not doing anything but it providing accessibility to this place and to protect the church building itself, which is a Queen Anne building. It's on both the Arlington Register and the State Register. It's something called MACRIS, M-A-C-R-I-S. And it is an historic structure. And that is why we went ahead and gave them the grant. In our deliberations, it was very important to us, as we have for every other nonprofit organization that we have given grants to, that we discuss how they let, how accessible they are to the public. And this was true for the Jason Russell House. It was true for the old Schwab Mill. It was even true for the Whittemore house's garage that we renovated. There had to be a public purpose in everything that we were funding because this is public money. This is not you know, expendable money, this is public money and we need to make sure that there is a really good history of people reaching out to the community. And I know that um, both Don Mills from the church the Covenant Church is here tonight, as well as the pastor who unfortunately has just had surgery on his voice. But Don is here to answer any questions that anybody has. But, you know, I have a nine member committee who are very, very careful. And like many people um, on the committee, we are not necessarily people that believe there shouldn't be separation between um, religion and the state. We're very careful about that. I think we reached out to find out exactly what the church was doing. And they did give us a very long documented history of what they were doing in the community. They, I actually went to the church. I'm actually handicapped. So I had to take a special route to get into the door but it was for the opening of the Housing Corporation of Arlington's um, units across the street. And 
I felt that it was very much a community-based church. They were looking forward to welcoming the, the new um, people that were living in those units. So not just me, but other members on the committee, and there were some very skeptical ones, really looked at it in detail and we, we, we came out in favor of this grant. Now, maybe other town meeting members, if they were sitting on this committee, wouldn't have felt the same way, but I rely on the people that I work with and they are just wonderful people. They're very careful people and they're very, um, you know, they listen to what Doug said, they listen to what the church said, and that's why we gave them the grant, but we really work very hard at it. I want to say one thing, one of the things that's come up recently is I was told that there was a member of the committee that was part of the church congregation. That is not true. It's absolutely not true. So, um, you know, this, there's one person who lives on the same street with the church, but <laughs> She is not a member of the congregation. So I just, you know, I urge you to turn down this um, reconsideration mo motion. We did our job. Um, we have public meetings in January and we urge town meeting members to really look at the end of January for what our Community Preservation Act um, agenda is. And if there are any items that you wanna know more about, please do it in January and not on June 8th. So um, thank you very much, Mr. Moderator. Thank you, Ms. Rowe. Uh, Mr. Moore, anything else? Thank you, Ms. Rowe. Um, my understanding is that the basis of reconsideration is new information and I would submit to the meeting that there is no new information here. Town Council's review was, compute, was dated December 1st, 2021, sorry, 2021, and public meetings were held by the CPAC committee. We delegated this task of vetting these things to the CPAC committee and we should not second guess their work. It's true that they didn't put every um, small item uh, of every decision in front of us in town meeting, but I don't think we want them to. Um, so I think we should not second guess their work. They've clearly done a, a detailed job and we should not reconsider this. Thank you. Right, thank, thank you, you thank you, thank you. Okay, and so, um, so here's what I'm gonna do next. Uh, the Mr. Ruderman earlier, uh, he kind of uh, uh, gave a, a bit of a teaser, right? That there's there's evidence to be shown um, and that this is new information uh, they wanted to bring to, uh, bring to light at town meeting. Um, and so if you vote to reconsider, then we can look at that evidence. Um, it kind of, I think it puts uh, town meeting in sort of an impossible situation, whether, like that if we don't see what that evidence is, then you can't really make uh, uh, an informed vote on whether to reconsider. Um, so what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna call Mr. Ruderman back up. Uh, this will be his second appearance on this, uh, on this motion. Uh, so that, that we'll afford him five minutes of speaking time as uh, uh, outlined in our bylaws. Um, and so I wanna offer Mr. Ruderman uh, the opportunity to show his evidence so that the meeting can make an informed decision about whether this is sufficiently uh, new information uh, that warrants uh, reconsideration of Article 62. So if we can bring Mr. Ruderman back up and start the timer. Uh, Mr. Ruderman, you have five minutes to uh, present your evidence that you referred to earlier. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. I, Michael Ruderman, Precinct 9. I was trying to stay within, within the confines of simply making the motion to reconsider, but upon your invitation, I'll go one step beyond that. The new information that I believe town meetings should have a chance to, to, to consider is the fact that there is a test for whether or not a grant to a religious institution is an appropriate use of the public money. There is a process here. It's very clearly laid out. It, this was only alluded to in the Community Preservation Act's uh, uh, committee's report. So we only had, had their assertion that they had been careful about this. No, we did not have the actual steps for how to reconcile the process. And I believe it is in the details of looking at the process and testing whether or not a grant is appropriate. And then looking at the evidence that we can pull in to say, well, what do we know about the evidence of this situation? And I would offer to you and, and to the members of, of this very long and hardworking meeting, 
that there is no evidence that this grant furthers an established public purpose outside of the one bare example of one public meeting uh, having to do with 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 housing that that uh, previous speaker had had uh, referenced, there is no history here of this institution offering its space to the public or inviting the public in to use its space, such that a grant of the public money would support the public purpose. We're not fixing historical architecture. We are not. Um, you know, bringing back uh, stained glass windows or, or, or a bell tower of significance. The church is on the historic inventory of the town and incorporated in the state's, uh, you know, record of, of, of uh, historic properties referred to by its acronym MACRIS. That's not in contention. Also, what's not in contention is that a grant to a religious institution from a town is allowable. What I'm saying the new information is, is that there's a way of testing that which we did not see in the Community Preservation Act Committee's report. We have the lack of public involvement to balance against the purposes of, is this bringing in the public and furthering the history of, of how the public uses the church's space, or is it simply support? maintenance, sidewalk and bathroom. I mean, there's nothing in here that we would compare even to, to what we see in town that, that different religious institutions offer their spaces to the public for you know, musical group rehearsal space, for Al-Anon meetings. Uh, there are no historic tours of the Covenant Church. There's no program that regularly invites in the public. There is no history here that we can say, yes, we are supporting that public purpose rather than simply saying, well, we're underwriting the maintenance budget. And that's the new information which we wish to put before the town meeting that gives them the tools to decide, is this an appropriate grant? And with every bit of good faith and and generosity of spirit towards the members of the Community Preservation Act Committee, I believe in their analysis, which we are asked to take, take on faith, and I will, it's not in the minutes, but we are asked to, asked to think that they considered these questions and came down on the side of, yes, it's allowable. I would offer to the meeting that if we look at it together, it is not an allowable grant. That is the new information, that there's a test process, there is a lack of, of substantiating information, and that we in town meeting can act upon that information and amend the original article to express our feelings. That's all, Mr. Moderator. Thank you. Okay, so, so if I could just try to summarize, uh, it sounds like the, the new information, like for the, for the benefit of the meeting, it sounds like the new information that, that Mr. Ruderman, that, you, that you're expressing here is... Uh, is a the new information is essentially a lack of public information that you were able to find uh, that satisfied the criteria for this funding to go forward. Is that, is that, that fair? there is a that there is a process of testing the validity of such a grant. It depends upon specific criteria. Those sure. criteria those criteria okay. for disallowance can be assuaged by a history so, so of we, public yeah. involvement, and well, we so can consider those. We are, we are at the, the five minute mark. Um, Thank you. So, um, uh, we do have a point of order from Ms. Hyam, so let's take that now. Um, Mr. Moderator, I'm not sure if this is appropriate. Uh, uh, under... Precinct. Sorry. Oh, so sorry. Leba Hyam, Precinct 15. I'm not sure if this is appropriate under a point of order, but nothing that was just stated in the argument was information that I had not had access to prior to the original vote on Article 62, and therefore the so, yes, whole I, thing that, that is, is out of order. Uh, yes, that, that, that is uh, not a point of order. Um, um, uh, I think, I think I, I'll stick with the summary that I made at the tail end of Mr. Ruderman's remarks, uh, that appears that the the new information that Mr. Ruderman is saying, uh, uh, it, is presented to the meeting is the lack of public information uh, that he was able to find about satisfying the criteria. So uh, I think I'll, I'll leave it at that. And 
Um, so we are now, uh, we just reached 29 minutes into debate on this article, uh, I'm sorry, on uh, reconsideration of Article 62. Um, and so uh, I am now going to entertain, I'm going to uh, invoke the, the so-called 15 minute rule, although applying it 29 minutes in. And so can we uh, enable raised hands in Zoom? And I'm gonna ask for anyone who is interested uh, in uh, terminating debate uh, to raise their hand. And okay. I guess I'll give folks a minute to just find the button. Okay, well, the number keeps going up. Um, Okay, so we are, I, I see a hundred raised hands and as mm -hmm. others have pointed out, um, actually, and actually it's more than that. Okay, so we're over 50% of the uh, participants have uh, raised their hands. It's not a two thirds threshold. Uh, but what I'm gonna do in this case is, uh, uh, I'm just gonna call on someone to uh, bring up a vote of terminate debate because we've seen that historically these raised hands uh, appear to be a significant undercount. Uh, we've seen this a, a number of times in termination of, of debate straw polls. So I think the fairest thing to do at this point, since there's clearly considerable interest in terminating debate, to actually put it to an official electronically tallied vote. Um, and if the meeting, if more than one third of the meeting wishes to continue debate, uh, then that's what we'll do. Um, so, okay, we have a point of order from Mr. Wagner. So let's take that. Thank you, Mr. Moderator, Carl Wagner, Precinct 15. I'm surprised that the order or the rules for the meeting are changing based on a determination of the time or the time of the meeting in, in the month. I, I wish you would not do that. And I, I, I think this is not the right way to proceed. Thank you. Okay, your objection is noted and we'll proceed and I'll, uh, Let's see, I will call on, um, let's see, uh, Ms. Henkin, uh, who has a hand raised, um, if uh, she is interested in terminating debate uh, to uh, make her motion. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Name and precinct, please. Anna Henkin, precinct six. I'd like to move the reconsideration and all things before it. Okay, so we have a motion to uh, terminate debate. Uh, so let's bring up a vote to terminate debate on reconsideration of Article 62. Okay, so voting should be opening momentarily. Uh, based on waves of precincts. Uh, if you see the yellow text, please uh, sit tight, don't just walk away. Um, uh, just within several seconds, your, your precinct will be uh, enabled for voting. Um, and we're voting here on whether to terminate debate on, on the uh, motion to reconsider Article 62. If you're in favor of terminating debate, uh, vote yes. If you want to continue debate on reconsideration, vote no. And I said, we, we have uh, an old point of order from, 
And, so, and we had, I'm sorry, we had a second from Ms. Ms. Gittleson. I don't think I mentioned that earlier. Um, we had a motion to terminate debate and a second from Ms. Gittleson. Um, I said we, we have a, a, an old point of order uh, from Ms. Bergman, which was from 9.55 PM. So if we can clear that um, to avoid confusion, that'd be great. Okay, we have about uh, almost 200 votes cast, which is another 30 seconds before we close voting on termination of debate of reconsideration of Article 62. 20 seconds until we close voting on termination of debate. Ten seconds until we close voting. Okay, uh, let's close voting. Okay, and the motion passes 168 in the affirmative, 28 in the negative. Uh, debate is terminated. So let's now uh, open up voting on uh, the main motion uh, to reconsider Article 62. Okay, and while we're bringing that up, we have a, a point of order from Mr. DiTulio. Let's bring that up. If this is related to Mr. DiTulio's comment in the Q&A about uh, restating the standard for a motion to reconsider before we vote. Um, well, why don't we bring up Mr. DiTulio, because I, I, I don't, I'm not sure if he's referring to the quantum of vote, which is two thirds according to our town bylaws. Uh, let's bring up Mr. DiTulio to make sure that um, I'm not misinterpreting his Q&A comment. Uh, can, can you hear me, Mr. Moderator? Yes, I can. Name and precinct, yep. please. James DeTulio, Precinct 12. No, I was referring not to the quantum, but to the, the I guess, the, the, the rule or the standard. What I, We've heard discussion about must provide new information or things of that nature. And I just wanted to be sure that before we vote, we know what the what right. so, so that, motion that, that's up to the time. was defined, right. I guess. Sure. So that, that's up to uh, whether there's sufficiently new information. I mean, there's kind of a first pass that I as moderator take. Um, and if there's reason to believe that like there's new information that's been brought to light, which isn't necessarily the creation of information. It could be information that previously existed, but wasn't widely known or understood. Right. So I take a pretty broad interpretation of that. And then a, a finer grained uh, interpretation of that is really I, I leave that to town meeting. Uh, for town meeting members to vote on whether they feel that there's sufficiently new information that they wish to uh, reconsider. So I, I'm leaving that to the meeting to decide if you've heard so far that there's reason enough to believe that there's new information that's been brought to light to you as a town meeting member that you wish to um, uh, have debate on uh, the merits of Article 62 and to entertain motions to amend it, um, then that, that's up to town meeting members to decide at this point. Um, but the the formal requirements are pretty broad. Um, okay, thank, thank you, you, Mr. Moderator. Okay. okay. 
I thought we had a general reconsideration entry in the uh, in the menu. Is that not appearing? It looked as though we had created one, or that one was created earlier, but we're not seeing it here in this menu. Um, are we able to just create a, like, uh, yeah, I think, I think all we can do at this point, I apologize for the delay, is to just create a, uh, a new agenda item um, for Article 62 reconsideration. Okay, and that's what we're gonna do. Apologies for that. Oh, so someone says they saw it reconsider two thirds option. Is that not okay? Oh, it looks like we have that there. Okay. Apologies for that. And while we bring that, uh, I saw a point of order, but it just disappeared. So. And we still have the outdated point of order from Ms. Bergman. Um, Okay, so we now have before us a vote on whether to reconsider Article 62. Um, if, if, uh, if you feel that there is sufficiently new information or context or understanding uh, that warrants reopening Article 62 so we can debate it again and potentially amend that and, ch and change the vote on the main motion, um, vote yes. Uh, if you do not wish to reconsider Article 62 any further, you can vote no. And can we put in the Q&A as folks are asking for the number to call in? Um, the town clerk's number has changed um, uh, for this meeting. I apologize for that. There was a technical reason why we needed uh, to use a different number uh, for her tonight. And so can we put in the Q&A the instructions for, uh, for voting, like if, especially uh, Ms. Brazil's number? Thank you. Okay, that information should now be in the, I'm sorry, in the chat. Yep. And so that number, if you need to reach it, is uh, uh, this, uh, the town clerk's number is Okay, we have a point of order from Mr. Rosenthal. Let's uh, let's bring that up. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Name and precinct, please. Mark Rosenthal, precinct fourteen. You gave the area code as seven six one. Is that correct? I would think. Oh, seven. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. That's why someone wrote seven eight one in the uh, in in the chat here. My my apologies. I misread that. That the Ms. Brazil's number. Uh, thank you, Mr. Rosenthal. Uh, Ms. Brazil's number is 781-608-6308. Okay, again, if you... Uh, wish to reconsider Article 62, um, vote yes. If you do not wish to reconsider Article 62, vote no. Vote no. Article 62, it's, it's currently disposed of. And so uh, a two thirds vote to reconsider would essentially reopen Article 62 and bring it before us. So if you feel that there's uh, sufficiently new information or context or understanding that's been brought to light uh, since the first time we debated and voted on uh, Article 62, you can vote yes to reconsider. Uh, if you want to keep the uh, Article 62 closed, keep it disposed of without reopening it, uh, you can vote no. OK, 
Okay, we've had uh, 200 votes cast so far. So let's just wait another 30 seconds to make sure we get enough, um, as many votes in as we can without waiting uh, an inordinate amount of time. So if you haven't voted yet, please get your vote in. 20 seconds until we close voting on reconsideration of Article 62. Ten seconds until we close voting, and this is a two-thirds vote. Okay, let's close voting. Okay, and the motion fails. Uh, Seventy-nine in the affirmative, one hundred twenty-one in the negative. Uh, Article sixty-two is not reconsidered, and. Uh, while there were multiple individuals uh, who gave notice of reconsideration on Article 62, uh, according to our town bylaws, once an article has been, uh, once there has been a vote on reconsideration uh, of an action, uh, no further reconsideration can be made. There's basically one shot at reconsideration and this was it. Uh, so Article 62 remains disposed of. And uh, we'll just uh, wait for the screens, uh, the voting screens to go by. Um, and with that, we have uh, one last article uh, in the annual town meeting warrant that has not been disposed of. Um, and yeah, now that we're done with all the articles and before we dissolve the meeting, um, Let's see. Are there any motions for reconsideration? Are, 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 sorry, already the motions for reconsideration. We're done with that. Uh, all the articles have been disposed of. Uh, Mr. Moderator. Mr. Foskett, that's your cue. Yep. <clears throat> I move that Article 3 be taken from the table. The okay, trouble. Second. Okay, so we have a motion from Mr. Foskett to remove Article 3 from the table, and we have a second from Ms. Brazil. Uh, let's make sure that uh, raised hands in Zoom are enabled. Uh, anyone who objects to taking Article 3 from the table. You can raise your hands now to object to that. Seeing no objections, uh, I see I see one hand raised hand from the panel. I don't know if that's just from before, from Mr. Oster. Um, okay, that hand has been lowered. Uh, so there are no objections, it's a unanimous vote. Article 3 is now uh, before us. Um, are there, this is a uh, last chance for any raised hands for any um, uh, reports of committees to be received. Seeing none. Mr. Uh, Moderator. Yes, Mr. Foskett. Uh, Charles Foskett, uh, Precinct 10. Uh, I move that the 2022 annual town meeting be dissolved. Okay, we have a motion to dissolve the annual town meeting. Do we have a second? Second. We have a second from Ms. Brazil. Um, uh, please uh, make sure that uh, raised hands are enabled in Zoom. Any objections to dissolving the 2022 annual town meeting? And any hands raised, I will recite your name for public shaming. Um, okay, I see no objections. So I consider that a unanimous vote. Uh, the 2022 annual town meeting is hereby dissolved. So thank you everyone for, for bearing with us. Uh, this was a very long slog of a town meeting. Thanks for everyone for, for sticking it out to the end uh, and all the participation. Uh, and hopefully next time we meet, hopefully that'll be in person at town hall. I sincerely hope so. All right. Have a good night, everybody.